Um, so as what was um, introduced a while ago, what I'll be introducing to you right now is a bit of a primer on what um, software defined networking is as a technology and how it also interrelates to another similar technology, which is called network function virtualization. So you may be wondering, um, in Asia Open Run, um, most of the courses that we are offering at the moment is focused on uh, the radio access network, right? So there are courses about um, the uh, intelligent controllers, the foundations of what the radio access network is, among other things, right? So this particular course, and specifically this topic, we focus more really on the not just the access terrain, but also on the transport and for the means of the holistic telecommunications network, right? Now, um, what I would be focusing on primarily is the use case that applies more on the telecommunications aspect or the use case more on the mobile communications, or mobile telecommunications or mobile broadband. So there are a lot of terminologies here, but in fact, all of them are um, arguably also the same. Later on, um, I'll be turning over the floor to Noel, and he will be also discussing another side of software-defined networking, but specifically more on the WAN and enterprise aspect. But having said that, allow me now to proceed with what would be um, software-defined networking as a whole, and how is it relate also to network function specialization. Now, these are the topics that I'll be discussing for this afternoon. I'll first briefly give you an overview on what software-defined networking is as a technology. I also need to describe to you the different components of what an SDN architecture returns to stuff, as well as its general functionality. I also understand the different advantages, benefits, and limitations of what SDN can offer. Although this is a technology that um, has gained traction specifically in the mobile communication space, uh, if we're going to look at it in retrospect, it's already an existing technology being used in specifically the IT or the code environment. But I'll more I'll give more of the details and the later on. Aside from that, I'll also give to you an overview of the different deployments or implementations on how we can have software dependent working in the mobile telecommunications environment. And aside from that, um, discuss to you what is open flow. Now, open flow is a protocol that is also uh, one of the protocols that is being used in our um, SDN and SDN technology in general. And how it lays out and its different components with respect to the architecture itself can also be fixed for you. Then lastly, um, I'll give a quick glimpse on what network functions virtualization is as a technology. Because if we're going to be um, comparing this in general, also to SDN, they can be considered as two separate technologies altogether. In fact, you can have SDN without NFV and vice versa. And in this topic, I'll be discussing to you how they can, in fact, be interconnected with each other. Okay? And lastly, um, in relation to that point, no, I'll also be discussing here how does SDN support NFV and vice versa. Okay? Now, um, we'll start off now with what is SDN in general. Now, some of you, I've noticed some of the um, interest that you have uh, entered in the uh, initial uh, slides. And one of the feedbacks there is efficiency and an artificial environment or artificial space. Now, we can consider SDN a sort of like in addition to being um, an artificial space, it's also more of like an abstraction. So whenever we say abstraction, this is just a means for us to um, have a logical means of separating what we have or what we see right now, and that is normally the hardware, to the logical components of the which is the software. Now, SDN in its own, or the technology itself, this is an approach to networking that uses software-based controllers or application programming interfaces to communicate with the underlying hardware. Back then, whenever we have traditional networking here, and the 
the networking that I'm very I'm going to be referring to here is more of the IP networking. You normally have a network environment or topology that would consist of say your um, network elements, say for instance your switches, and these switches are then configured with um, their protocols and running files individually, meaning part of the life cycle of a switch or a router before it is being connected to a um, topology, an existing topology like that, you have to configure it with the necessary parameters, turn on the necessary ports, um, enable the necessary protocols, etc. on a device level. Meaning that all of the configurations are somewhat isolated in a specific device or equipment. Right? Now, how does now this device be able to see or make itself known in the network? This is where our protocols will come in, right? So we rely on protocols to ensure that even though a device, whether existing or not, is um, available in the network, for instance, it becomes faulty or um, it loses its configuration, or say on the hardware level, it suddenly powers down. The network itself would have the least impact in terms of passing and forwarding traffic. Right? So there would still be convergence. But regardless, there is still the underlying um, dependency of these network devices to be seen in the network, right? And in terms of troubleshooting and configuration, these are still isolated devices within the network. Now, how does SDN come in the picture? SDN, from the, from the first two words, software defined, you are essentially abstracting or turning the configurations, although they are already in the software level, to be a bit more unified. So I, I, I'll, put, I'll use the term unified or consistent throughout the entire technology. In a software-defined network, a network engineer or architect or administrator is now able to shape or track uh, the traffic from a centralized control console. And when we mean centralized control, we just mean that the configurations, the protocol um, changes, all of all of the parameter um, adjustments that need to be done is no longer isolated in a specific network device or in a specific switch. It is now centralized to what's called an SDN controller. Okay. Now, having said that, we can now overlay or we can now represent our network to be in two layers. In the control plane, this is where your configurations would be coming in. And then finally, you also have your data plane, wherein the actual traffic is being forwarded or referenced. Okay? So this process is a move away from traditional network architecture in which individual network devices make traffic decisions based on their configured routing tables. Or to be more specific, individual device level routing tables. Okay? Now, in an SDN architecture, because there is already a separation between um, the hardware and the software, meaning the control and the um, data itself, we're essentially decoupling them into two separate um, layers. In the SDN, it moves the control plane that determines where to send traffic to software and leaves the data plane that actually forwards traffic in the hardware. What we're essentially doing here is that the switches, they become what's called, quote unquote, dumb pipes or dumb switches, wherein majority of the configurations are already being done on the controller level or SD on controller level. This allows network administrators to use SD on to program and control the entire network from a single thing of glass instead of doing the configurations on a per device basis. So that's where also I'm coming from just a while ago, um, expressing or um, explaining to you that the configurations are no longer being done per device. Whenever there is say, a faulty device or a faulty switch, you now rely on the controller or the SDN controller 
to ensure that there is still network convergence, even though one of the devices become available unavailable due to faulty or a misconfiguration. Okay. Now, how do we now lay out the SDN architecture? Now, we can consider now, remember what I said a while ago, that we are essentially separating the control from the data. Now, overlaying this as a diagram, we can now have three layers in general. So we still have software components here, and yes, we still have hardware components, right? It's just a matter of assigning how these components function in our network topology. Now, a typical representation of the SDN architecture comprises normally of three layers. Okay? So in this consists of the application layer, the control layer, and the infrastructure layer. Each of these layers then communicate through a series of application programming interfaces for APIs. Okay? Um, this is more of like already um, simplifying in a way the network such that configuration can then be only isolated in the control layer. Now, I'll be briefly explaining also what is each of the, the layers represent, right? Now, I'll start from the top, going to the bottom. So first off, we have the application layer. One advantage of SDN is that because of the softwareization, so that's also a term, right? The, the softwareization of the functionalities, you can also include additional features and functionalities also in your overall product or overall um, uh, offering. So I'm already referring to here the, uh, the features or the service themselves. Whenever we have um, uh, SDN deployed in a network, normally this would come in the form of this um, service or a bundle being offered by vendor providers and manufacturers. Now, because the controller, the SDN controller itself, is already being placed as a single layer. As an offering, vendors also have the capability to include additional features or functionalities that can further enhance the network, such as firewalls, anti DDoS, you know, web filtering, which in retrospect is represented as separate network elements, but because the controller itself is already intelligent enough to do the configurations. It can also be um, configured to have more features. And this is where the application layer would come in. So a bit of context there, a bit of a long-winded explanation, but there you go. Um, the application layer now, what is, what is it? This contains the typical network applications or functions that organizations can normally use. Now, keep in mind that application, this doesn't just limit yourself to say Microsoft Word or Chrome, or these are what you would call desktop applications. The applications being referred to in the um, network perspective or even in the transport perspective, these are somewhat likened to features that you would want to have in your network in order to ensure better service or perhaps to improve the overall performance. So the application here would normally consist of load balancers, firewalls, filtering, um, anti-spam detection, etc. So the traditional network would use a specialized appliance, meaning this is a separate hardware altogether, such as a firewall or load balancer. An SDN network replaces the appliance with an application that uses a controller to manage the data plane. So this is what I mentioned also a while ago that in terms of what vendor manufacturers are already being offered, are currently also offering in the market nowadays, apart from or aside from the SDN controller itself, they also offer additional features that come as applications. Okay? Now, apart from this, we also have the control layer. So this is arguably what you would say the real part of the SDN architecture. Okay. This represents the centralized SDN controller software that acts as the brain of the SDN network. Okay. This controller resides on a server and manages policies and traffic flows throughout the network. The control layer 
is normally represented as the SDN controller. So later on, in fact, I'll, I'll be also showing you a diagram of the architecture when overlaying to the um, the physical network topology when overlaying to the architecture, the logical architecture. Okay. Now, moving on to the other layers. So going one level lower or the lowest layer, we have the infrastructure layer. This is where your physical switches would now reside. Okay. Now, because the configurations, the protocol adjustments, the overall intelligence of the network has already been offset towards the SDN controller, this layer just essentially functions as data forwarders. Okay? And this is also where the notion of a dump switch would already come in. Because essentially what that is just what the switch would normally would do. It would now rely on the SDN controller to ensure that the parameters and configurations it needs um, to forward the traffic would be coming from the controller itself. Okay. Now all three layers are then connected to what's called APIs. Perhaps you have heard the term API, application program interface, especially for those who are in the um software development um, sector or software development industries. Normally, you use APIs whenever you want to exchange information across to, say, web applications. Now, the context of APIs in an SDN environment somewhat also applies to that, meaning that its goal or why we have APIs is because we want to exchange data across the different layers. But the only difference of an API used in an SDN environment versus, say, an API that is used to exchange information between three websites is, of course, the type of data that you pass through the API. Okay? Now, the layers communicate using respective northbound and southbound APIs. So as also illustrated in the diagram here a while ago, you have here northbound APIs, which are the APIs used to communicate from the SDN controller towards the applications, okay? And you also have the southbound APIs, which allows the controller to communicate downwards towards your infrastructure or your switches. Now, the APIs uh, are used by the applications so that the applications can talk to the controller and ensure that um, the services that we offer are made available to the topology. While southbound APIs are used for, by the controller to communicate with the switches. Okay. Now, one of these APIs, in fact, uses a protocol, and this is where OpenFlip would come in. And more of that one later on. But the general question on whether, because we're already talking about um, networks, um, telecommunications in general, do you have a specific standard for the API itself? Okay. Now, for SDN, there's, there's currently no formal standard, meaning we rely on what the vendor offers based on their solution. Okay? What we do have, however, are sort of like guidelines and best practices on how they can implement the APIs between their controllers and any compatible forwarding switches that would allow the controller to communicate with. Okay? Now, um, in terms of availability, are there open source solutions that other, enter, um, other companies or organizations is able to, to have in their network? So see, suppose we want to have SDN enabled in my topology, but currently I don't have, say, the capital um, budget for me to purchase or to procure. Um, solutions being offered by, by um, manufacturers. Is it, is it possible that I can implement SDN using open source software? So definitely, yes. Okay. So this is where the solution called Open Daylight could come in. Open Daylight, this is an open source platform that allows you to implement SDN using open source software. So this is completely, you can say that this is free software also. And it also puts positions or it, it also puts organizations in the position of saying if they want to develop their own SDN platform, they can use OpenDaylight as a basic framework and they can modify it 
to suit their needs. Okay? So that is the architecture or um, the, the logical architecture of SDM in general. Now, um, why do we even want to implement SDM in the first place? So are, what are the benefits of having SDM enabled in the network technology? Of course, this is, this is a technology that would still have its own advantages and limitations. So meaning, is it possible for us to outweigh the benefits that we can offer versus the limitations that it is currently imposing? Now, what are its differences? Of course, SDN is software-based. Software-based, the context of configurations and um, traffic forwarding. It comes from the definition or the overall functionality that SDN is able, you're now able to essentially program your routing uh, without going to the device level. So that is what the context of software is, uh, software based is. Okay? Control is centralized via the SDN controller. Again, this comes from having a single plane of class across your entire topology. Centralized configuration and resource provisioning. So that also comes as another point. And finally, security is centralized, meaning that unlike in your um, traditional networking, wherein you have to ensure that each of your devices are hardened, so meaning you implement say, um, security um, patches or features and you have to manually configure them across all of the devices. So in an FDM environment, in an ideal scenario, all you have to do is to implement them in the controller and then the controller will be the one to propagate it across your network. Okay, so these are, if you're going to look at it now, these are pretty big statements and pretty big promises that SDN is able to deliver. And of course, similar to other technologies, this also has different caveats. So definitely, um, although these are benefits on its own in terms of real life application and real life scenarios, um, this is not always the case. And in fact, um, to be more specific on the third, on the second, the second, third, and fourth points of SDN that's being shown here, no? um, having the SDN controller centralized, it doesn't mean that you literally only have one device, or literally only one physical controller. Okay? You can implement availability and resiliency in your controllers by still having an active standby setup meaning that in your network, the you only have one logical SDN controller, but on the premise that it goes down, there is one that is currently set up as a standby and able to support your um, forwarders on the premise that it does go down. So it's not really a single point of failure as well. So and it, this also depends on the type of solution that a vendor is able to offer. So that's one. And the other one is, of course, also security. Okay? Because security is centralized, this doesn't just also mean that security is enforced to see the least. Okay? This is because it also can be considered as a possible vulnerability as well because you also have a single point of attack. Right? So this is also one thing that um, administrators and architects would also have to keep in mind when they want to deploy or how they want to deploy their SDM uh, controllers. Okay. Now, some of the benefits of having SDM in our network, I've already discussed some of them. So I'll go through um, a few of them here. So number one, simplified policy changes with an SDN environment or SDN um, network an administrator can change any network switch rules when necessary. So because it is centralized, you can also simplify the changes or modifications being done in the um, network policy in general. And again, you just rely on the controller to propagate said policies across your network. And having said that, second point comes here, network management and visibility. Only one centralized controller is needed to distribute the policies to the connected switches. So this is supposed to say configuring several 
switches manually one by one. And we all know how not only is uh, is that step tedious, but also prone to error, right? So if you, for instance, you're trying to configure only one um, one switch, and then when you copy paste it to a different uh, switch, and then suddenly you don't know why that switch is not being seen by the network because you just forgot to change the network name of that switch to the new one. So those a bit of nuances here as well. So SDN is able to simplify that. Okay. Another one, uh, this is also a bit of a caveat, no? reduced hardware footprint and operating expenses. Coming from a traditional network, meaning that showing here again the diagram a while ago, uh, we need to maintain several switches at once, right? And if we're going to, to compare them like for like, you know, switches that are um, feature heavy, of course, cost more compared to say, just having a dumb switch that is just essentially forwarding packets, right? So meaning in terms of say, um, support, maintainability, and in the bigger picture, the operational expenses that a company or organization is incurring, of course, having feature heavy switches would have more of an impact in the OPEX of say, just maintaining one controller with several forwarding switches alone. Okay. Of course, this is there is still a um, caveat here, but in general, because SDN, um, you are already. Uh, utilizing simplified switches. Of course, the cost of these switches are lesser compared to having feature-heavy switches. Okay? That's how OPEX can be impacted to uh, be reduced. Okay? Then, of course, last point is networking innovations uh, because of the software uh, nature of SDM. No? This also makes it more open to other innovative functionalities or features that organizations can look into. Uh, SDN contributed to the emergence of software-defined wide area network technology, which employs the virtual overlay aspect of SDN. Okay. Now, I mentioned here a new terminology, software one. So later on, uh, Noel will be discussing this in detail. Because SD one itself, this is a use case that normally would be seen in the enterprise space. There's much more of that one later. Now, alongside with the benefits, of course, like what I have said, um, it's not a um, magic bullet that is able to answer all of the transport-related issues that um, uh, an organization or an operator is currently facing. There are still also some challenges, still challenges and limitations that the technology is facing. Okay? So number one of that, I've already mentioned a while ago, is security. Okay. So security in the SDN space is both a benefit and a possible concern. Okay. This is because your controller having it as a centralized node, right? it is also a possible single point of failure. And it is also a possible target for an attacker to infiltrate into. That is why it is important for administrators to always look carefully on who they give access to the controller okay? and what type of traffic the controller is able to pass. Okay, so that's one. Another limitation is unclear definitions. Because we don't have an overall de facto standard for SDN. Okay? Different vendors offer various approaches to SDN. And you can count the number of possible use cases that you can have in SDN as much as the number of vendors who offer it. Okay? There are different models and deployments on how you can implement SDN. And this is sort of like a spectrum of sorts, eh? wherein um, where do you want? Do you want to book your software in your um, implementation? Meaning you're just going to be purchasing um, software applications and licenses and it's already the organization's responsibility to offer the hardware that can be considered as SDN. Or 
you can go all the way on the other end and even have the vendor offer a bundle of hardware and software as part of your solution. And still, it can also be considered as an estimate. So with the rising variety of what um, the technology can offer, based also on the organization that would require it, also spans a challenge of really having a standardized means of deploying SDN. Okay. Now, having said that, what point that was also considered to be related to this is number three, market confusion. Okay. Some networking initiatives are often mistaken as SDN, okay. which includes also white box networking, network disaggregation, automation, and programmable networking. There are some vendors who say that they have SDN as part of their offering, but if you're going to look at it in a um, techni technical perspective or say in an overlay, it's not in the SDN. So remember the architecture that I have said a while ago that SDN, the, the, if you want the real basic definition of what SDN is, you have to make sure that the control plane is separated from the data plane. Okay. So how it is is it being done? It is now based on what the vendor can offer. This is also where organizations and operators are also keen into the team because some vendors can market themselves to be SDN enabled, but in reality it is just network disaggregation. Or it's just white maps. Or it's just a VLAN. So, among other things. Okay. And last point, adop slow adoption and costs. SDN technology, it is a relatively old technology if we're going to look at it. Um, meaning, it has already been existing in the market and in the industry for more than two decades already, right? So, it, it started off as 2011, so already 2024. And two decades have passed, there is still um, a lot of um, open-ended challenges that this technology is still facing. So arguably, we can say that it has already reached maturity, but it is not yet um, it is not yet open for obsolescence, or it's not yet being obsoleted by organizations because they are still using the technologies. So many enterprises cite the cost of SDN deployment to also be a deterring factor. This is also where the challenge of procuring SDN would come in. Right? So say, for instance, you are an organization and you want to say, have this one in your network and you find out through an RFP that this um, four vendors have the, have the SDN offerings also, all of the bells and whistles that you want in your intelligent network implemented. And when you look at the bill and the overall cost, my God, it is astronomical to say the least. So that is also one factor that needs to be considered, right? Now, SDM, despite its multiple deployments and multiple iterations, we can say that it also has different things or models on how we can implement. So, you can see that you can have SDN implemented into your network just by looking into what part of the control plane and the data plane you want to disaggregate or abstract. Okay? And you also look into how you want to abstract them. Can you implement the controller to be appliance-based, meaning it has its own hardware, and still consider it as SDN? Or do I only have to have the controller implemented as a virtual machine only to say it to be SDN? So these are some questions. No? So, and um, I'm presenting to you here four basic model types, but like what I have said a while ago, it also differs or it also varies based on what the vendors can offer. Right now. now, what are these four? First off, we have open SDN. Okay. You can have SPN wherein you just have the protocol enabled, such as OpenFlow. Okay. Network administrators use the protocol like OpenFlow to control the behavior of virtual and physical switches at the data plane level. 
In other words, in an open in an open SDM model, if you just have an SDM enabled protocol such as Open Flow, you technically already have a VM. So it's as simple as that. Or you can even implement of the end by APIs, meaning that in, um, instead of using an open protocol, APIs control how data moves through the network on each device. So this is SDN by APIs. Next one, overlay model. So another deployment and um, arguably in the mobile communication space to transport the name. This is also where the common, the, 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 the Overly model in the hybrid SDN is normally being implemented or the most common implementations. In the SDN overlay model, another type of SDN where you run a virtual network on top of an existing infrastructure. Okay? Meaning that you already have your network in here. You already have overlay your um, topology or your network in general. And you implement another layer on top of it that can also be considered as SDN. And this layer is purely logical, meaning that we allow the controller to already manage existing switches that you already have in your network. In other words, you don't necessarily need to have new hardware, new switches to implement SDN. You can even, in fact, just use the existing switches that you have right now in the network, okay? Install them with the necessary agents that would support SDN, and then boom, you have the SDN there. So that's also one problem. That's also one um, deployment that can be considered. And lastly, you also have hybrid SDN. So this combines SDN with traditional networking protocols, such as say for Wi-Fi or for microwave. You can you can combine them with traditional transport um, methodologies and practices, and you would still have SDN. And what I mentioned a while ago, majority of organizations that we have right now, um, not just the big operators that we have, but also um, uh, small to medium enterprises, we have hybrid SDN normally commonly implemented. Okay, so it's just a matter of, say, how do you want to implement it? As long as you can separate the control plane from the user plane, you know, it is not technically considered as SDN. That's, that's how lenient the technology is, right? Now, um, in terms of the protocols themselves, I mentioned OpenFlow. So what is it in general? OpenFlow, this is the multi-vendor standard defined by the Open Networking Foundation for implementing SDN. Now, do you need OpenFlow to implement SDN? Arguably, no. You can, in fact, utilize other protocols to implement the same technology. But majority of open source um, implementations that we have support OpenFlow as part of their offerings. No? Now, how does the protocol work in the environment or in the architecture? It defines the interface between the controller and the switch. So it allows the controller to instruct the switches on how to handle incoming data packets. Now, um, if we're going to look at the controller and the switch itself in the logical perspective, this is how it would look like, specifically the open flow switch. Um, keep in mind, this is a logical representation. So, of course, you won't be able to see a physical boot table inside the switch. This is just a way for us to represent the different functionalities a switch would have. Okay. Through OpenFlow, and assuming that also the OpenFlow switch is able to support OpenFlow protocol, we can say that the switch itself has these basic components. You have your boot tables, your meter tables, and more importantly, the flow tables. Okay. Now, we have a separate um, course or separate modules for um, the different functionalities of what an open switch consists of. But the main point that I want to drive here is that OpenFlow as a protocol you know, represents the switch in such a way that you may have noticed the switch doesn't have an intelligence 
whatsoever. Right? I mean, more importantly, you only have this portion, the flow table, wherein the packets are already being accessed. Okay. This is because majority of the quote unquote intelligence is already found in the controller itself. Okay? Now, how does now the open flow architecture overlay with SDN? Okay? So, the open flow architecture, arguably, you know, and perhaps coincidentally, can be now overlaid into your SVN architecture such that through an open flow controller, this would now serve as your control plane. Okay? Your open flow switches would serve as your data plane or your forwarding plane or infrastructure plane. Okay? And the control plane, the controller, open flow can also have applications inside. Remember that the controller, you can implement this as a server, right? So if you know your Linux and you can implement your um, services inside, you can do so already. And also um, similarly in open flow architecture. Okay? The open flow, uh, open flow controller maintains the open flow protocol communications channels to the open flow switches, maintains a local state graph of the open flow switches, and exposes a northbound uh, API to the open flow applications. Okay, so you'll notice now that um, the open flow architecture fits perfectly into the SDN architecture here as well, because again, there is the separation between the control and the data planes. Okay. Now, that is SDN in a nutshell. Okay, so I discussed there a lot of um, terminologies and nuances, but I'll pause a bit here on what SDN is and I'll focus on another technology that is um, can be treated on its own. Okay? And I, I may I mentioned that it's because virtualization, if you're going to look at it from a bigger perspective, cannot really involve SDN altogether. You can have virtualization even without SDN and vice versa. Okay. Notice that in my discussion a while ago about SDN, I don't really necessarily, or very few did I mention the term, you know, the term virtualization as a key component of SDN. Right? What's the key component of SDN? You just have to make sure that the control plane is split from your data plane. And then that's it. How you implement it, this is where virtualization can be considered as a use case. Now, having said that, what is virtualization in general? For network functions virtualization. And if you, this is a deployment approach. Okay, well, let's put it like that. Or you can see that this is also a paradigm on how you can implement your network elements or services. This is the way for us to utilize virtualization to implement network elements. Okay, back then, whenever you have say a new service, let's let's take the 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 most common um, mobile service that we have nowadays, which is five G. Okay. In a typical five G architecture, you would normally have specifically in the core network, you, know, you would have there a gateway, a control oh. gateway. Um, you also have your VAAA network elements that ensures authentication by subscribers. No? And you also have the gateway or the data gateway that is responsible for um, opening the data pipelines for subscribers. No? So the moment you, you turn on your mobile data, you are essentially creating your own data pipe. And the one who is responsible for Maintaining that data type you know, is, the, is the, the data gateway. So if I were to simplify the, um, the discussion like that, the control gateway is normally responsible for connecting the subscribers through the wireless access network towards your core network. Okay. It's important to understand that the core network, this is where majority of the services of your um, mobile broadband reside. So your voice calls, your 
um, internet, no, voice over Wi-Fi, the services would um uh, would be the same of you. Okay. Now, um, having said that, where does now um, NFB would come in? Normally, these services would be deployed to have its own physical box, a physical appliance. No? Meaning, if I want to have 5G, I need to have um, a dedicated box for my data gateway. I need to have a dedicated box for my control gateway, and so on and so forth. This has been the um, conventional norm, especially for operators, whenever they want to offer new services to their subscribers. Okay. And the one that I'm also discussing to you, this is the, what you would call the appliance-based deployment. The point here is that the services themselves are associated or coupled tightly to your hardware. Meaning that if I want to say have a firewall service, I need to purchase a dedicated hardware that can only run the firewall service. I cannot reuse my firewall hardware to function as a web server or as a database. I cannot do that in an appliance-based environment. But in NFB, you can. Okay? This is because NFB, you can say that NFB um, took a similar path to SDN, wherein in SDN, this is normally, or this one was used in the IT environment or IT space, and then implemented in um, enterprise and telecommunications. And if we took a similar step, wherein you take servers now, commercial of the shelf hardware, examples of these would be your Dell, your HP, your Cisco, no? um, hardware that is already available, generic hardware, install it with a piece of software that would allow it to create virtual machines and deploy the services inside the virtual machines. Okay. This type of deployment is in fact already being used in the IT space. Specifically, if say I want to have um, a separate virtual machine that would host my website, I don't necessarily need to purchase a separate hardware dedicated for my website anymore. Or say I, I, I want to have a database. I don't need to necessarily have a, a dedicated hardware just to host my database. Through virtualization, it's possible for me to compress all of these different applications and services into much more denser deployments. There is still hardware involved, in fact. But you're just reducing the overall footprint that you would have in your data center. NFV uses a similar approach, wherein not... Um, Unlike in your IT workloads, where in the virtual machines are your databases, your web applications, no? um, in NFB, the virtual machines are used to host the D gateway, the control gateway, the Wi Fi server, functions that you would normally find in a mobile broadband network. So that is NFB. You are essentially virtualizing mobile broadband or fixed core network functions. Okay. It has its own advantage, definitely. And one key advantage that it poses is, of course, the reuse of your hardware. Okay. If I don't want my virtual firewall to be hosted in that hardware anymore, I can just delete that commission the, the virtual firewall and then repurpose the hardware for a different application altogether. That is enough for you. Okay. It also follows now, so the NFP as a technology similar to SDN, it also follows an architecture. So this one, we also have a separate course, a separate module for this in our um, uh, foundational course no, for SDN and NFP. But just to give you a glimpse of what NFP is as an architecture, it consists of also three basic parts. You have your infrastructure. You have your functions. This is where the network services would, would reside. And the key difference of NFB versus a 
appliance-based deployment is the presence of an orchestration layer. Okay. Or, to be more specific, the management, automation, and better orchestration, the manage. Okay? So, the, the, the specific details for each of these components for Earth is in practice by similar modules, but this is just the high-level architecture for you, no? um, just for you guys to appreciate. Okay? Now, I've introduced now to you NFD. How does it now interoperate with SDN? Right? Remember that on SDN, you now have a separation between control and user space or user space. How can NFD support this deployment? No? NFD, because you now have virtualization in play, you can in fact virtualize the controllers. They can come in the form of now what you would call virtual SDN controllers. That is one possible use case. Okay. Now, in this slide, no, SDN separates the network forwarding functions from the network control functions with the goal of creating a network that is centrally manageable and programmable. NFB abstracts the network functions from the hardware. In other words, through NFB, you are essentially decoupling already the functionality from the hardware. So now, in an ideal space, in an ideal scenario, Suppose I want to deploy a firewall in my network. The firewall itself back then, or um, traditionally speaking, this firewall service is just isolated in one geographical space or one geographical place, meaning all of its components can just be found in one, um, one location. Through SDN, it's now possible that I can deploy a virtual firewall that is hosted in, say, so just to give you um, uh, a basic example. In a traditional network, I want to deploy my firewall in, say, Quezon City. Of course, the service is just available also in Quezon City. I can make it available to other um, to other uh, regions with traffic forwarding, but the device itself is just inside Quezon City, right? Its software is also found in the location where you, you deploy your hardware. Okay. But if I want to deploy it as a virtual firewall, in theory, you know, I can have a virtual firewall that logically is still in Quezon City, but the server where it is hosted can be found in, say, Tarlac. The storage that it uses can be found in, say, Cavite. And then the transport can be found, say, in Laguna, for instance. So the different components are already disaggregated, decoupled across geographical locations, but the network still sees it as one logical node. And how do we do that? Okay. Okay. So this is now technically possible things. Okay, now there are a lot of still nuances on what SDN is no, as a technology, as I have also mentioned. And um, what the, the topics that I have just discussed here are just literally the tip of what the technology can offer. You know? And there are also other nuances that also have to be considered whenever we want to deploy SDN and MFD in general. And some of these ones can in fact be found in our um, uh, course, now foundational course for FUMI and MFD. 